Good morning. Thank you for coming. My name is Jeff Moore. I'm Senior Vice President and Chief Development Officer of Altarum Institute. And I want to thank you for taking the time to join us here this morning. This morning, we're going to be talking about SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And more specifically, we are going to spend some time looking at innovative approaches to incenting healthier food purchases by SNAP participants. Our conversation today couldn't be more timely. In about an hour, the Senate begins its markup of the Farm Bill. And our conversation really couldn't be any more important. Remember that in 2013, SNAP is serving more than one in seven Americans, people who are struggling day in, day out to put food on the table. SNAP is truly at the heart of our nation's nutrition safety wet net. I'm going to ask my colleague Lauren Bell, co-director of our Center for Food Assistance and Nutrition, to introduce our topic and our speakers in a bit more detail here in a moment. But first, I wanted to give you just a few brief words about Altarum. Um, and say a word of two thanks to our co-sponsors and to also talk about the, the rules of the road to the session. So first about Altarum, for those of you who might not know us, we are a nonprofit health systems research and consulting organization, and we work with government clients, foundations, the policy community, and the private sector to better understand and to solve some of the most complex systems challenges that impact human health. The topic we're discussing here today is one of those systems. And we have been proud to work for many years with the Food and Nutrition Service at USDA to help design, implement, and evaluate programs that serve some of America's most vulnerable. A special word of thanks to our co-sponsors, to the American Society for Nutrition, and for grant makers in health. We're particularly pleased that the foundation community has joined us in this session, as will become evident uh, in the course of the presentations, the role that philanthropy has played and will continue to play in this area is really vital. And we're very glad and honored to have their voices so well represented here today. Finally, just a word about process. This is meant to be a round table. We have a few too many folks to sit in this room around a table, um, but we really do look to encourage conversations. So after the presentations are made, there will be dedicated time allotted to conversation, uh, and we hope that all of you will actively participate. I also want to uh, remind you that we have, I think, about 500 folks registered on our webcast, so they will be submitting questions as well. So with that, let me turn to Lauren to get us started. Thank you, Jeff. Um, as Jeff said, I'm Lauren Bell. I'm an institute fellow and co-director of the Center of Food Assistance Nutrition at Altarum. And prior to that, I, for 20 years, I administered food assistance programs at the state level. So uh, I have been on both sides of the issue um, as we look at how food assistance programs impact the health and the diet of lower income Americans. And Jeff is right, this couldn't be a more timely issue, um, not only at the national level, but the headline in my local newspaper this morning in Portland, Maine, was, should SNAP participants be allowed to buy snack foods? And that brought the issue to the forefront because one of the people interviewed for that headline was a SNAP recipient who said, I'd love to buy more fruits and vegetables, but they're so expensive. Can't they give us some sort of financial incentive to help out? So it is relevant, and I really didn't make that up. Um, so I was very pleased to have seen that this morning. Um, the SNAP program is the cornerstone of the food assistance programs and the safety net for many Americans. Many Americans who have struggled over the last several years have had to turn to SNAP to be able to put food on their plates to feed their families. These are folks that have never before been on the SNAP program, and the idea of a subsidized food assistance program is very new to them. 
always and early on in the program, the SNAP program was considered a foundation for food security, that we knew that the people could have access to foods if they had this financial assistance. It has more and more become an issue related to childhood obesity prevention. The choices that SNAP participants make are influenced by any number of factors. They're influenced by policy, such as what people are allowed to purchase for SNAP, how SNAP programs are implemented, and how access is provided to the SNAP benefits. They're influenced by the environment, how they're able to access healthy foods in their local neighborhoods, how they're able to use their SNAP benefits in different places to be able to obtain the foods that they need that can help their families thrive and grow. It's influenced by education given to SNAP recipients around why it's important to eat healthy foods, but I think most importantly these days, it's influenced by motivation. How do you motivate people to make the choices for healthy foods? At Altarum, we've been doing a lot of research over the last 17 years around the SNAP program and SNAP education and the food assistance programs in general. And I wanted to highlight on a couple of things that we've learned from our research before I introduce the speakers and talk about how we're going to um, address the topic today. What we have learned from our research is that policy can impact healthy food choices. Just witness what we have seen recently with the school meals programs and changes in policy around providing healthier foods in schools and the implementation of the new Healthy WIC food package, where a study at Alturum showed that in four states, more and more small grocery stores were carrying fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and lower fat milk, which they had never carried before, providing more access to all families in the neighborhoods, not just WIC clients. We know that access is important, that being able to access healthy foods from clients is critical. The implementation of EBT systems at farmers markets and programs like what we're going to hear about today have improved the access of healthy foods to, to folks, and we know that that is a key factor in their decision making. We also know that what that client this morning said has come through in much of our research, recently conducted a numerous focus groups of SNAP recipients who universally were saying fruits and vegetables are perceived to be very expensive and that if they buy these and their family won't eat them, then it's a waste of resources and they often will only trust the foods that they know their clients will, will eat. And we also know, however, that kids are good targets for healthy foods and that if you provide them with a healthy snack of fruit and vegetable, that they will enjoy it, eat it, and will be intrigued by the variety and differences in the foods. We also have learned that integrated approaches to working on the problem of obesity are really key. And that's just not multiple approaches, that's integrated approaches. Approaches that bring together common messaging and themes have a great deal more success than simply throwing multiple programs at people, which can cause sort of a white noise of confusion. And finally, we know that we can change behaviors, that a concentrated effort in this area can make a difference in family choices. So today we have a story to tell and a story around a program that's being operated in numerous states but is, is keyed in Michigan that talks about how you can provide incentives for folks to purchase healthy foods and eat. So we have a distinguished panel here today to talk about the programs. Um, Audrey Rowe, who will be here shortly, is the director of uh, and administrator for the Food and Nutrition Services at USDA and directs the food assistance programs, 15 of them, that are run across the country to help folks. Audrey, when she arrives, will set the, set the scale of what FNS is doing with these programs now and how FNS is supporting healthy eating behaviors through multiple efforts throughout the program in the area of policy. We also have with us to talk about the food environment and how that transitioned into healthy eating incentives, Linda Jo Doctor, who is the program officer for the Kellogg Foundation. Linda Jo is a program officer and director in Battle Creek, Michigan. And in this role, she helps develop program priorities, reviews and recommends proposals for funding, and manages and monitors a portfolio of active grants. As a member of the Food, Health, and Well-Being team, her work focuses on the impact of environmental conditions on health equity. She co-leads the Food and Community Program Initiative designed to transform food systems and the physical environments in places where children live, learn, and play in Michigan. 
Ms. Doctor leads, co-leads the foundation's place-based work in Detroit focused on creating conditions so vulnerable children and families can thrive. Linda Joe will be talking about the food environment and how that moved toward the Healthy Incentives Program. To talk about the program specifically is Dr. Oren Hesterman. And we joke because I have to work on my enunciation because we have an Oren and a Lauren on the panel today. Um, Dr. Hesterman is the national leader in sustained agriculture and food systems. He's the author of Fair Food, which you have on your most of your seats here, and is has been focusing on sustainable food systems for all, and has provided an inspiration to change not only how we eat, but how food is grown and delivered. Uh, for 15 years, he worked as a program director for food systems at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and he has also played an essential role in establishing the Michigan Food Policy Council and has made significant contributions to the funding of healthy food and farming through his leadership in sustained agriculture. But change can't happen without looking at the political environment as well, and we are very pleased to have with us the former Secretary of Agriculture, Dan Glickman. Mr. Glickman is a fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center and head of the Aspen Institute, um, a nonpartisan education group for members of Congress. I knew Mr. Glickman as a program administrator when he uh, was Secretary of Agriculture from March 1995 to January 2001, where under his leadership, the Department of Agriculture administered farm and conservation programs, modernized the SNAP program through the implementation of, of such things as EBT, and made significant changes in, in policy to help promote healthy foods in, in America. And finally, as this is a round table. We are going to have a responder um, person modify, uh, excuse me, moderating the uh, questions and answers that might be coming through. And that is Dr. Faith Mitchell with Grantmakers in Health. Dr. Mitchell is president and CEO of Grantmakers in Health and previously served as vice president for program and strategy at the organization. Before joining Grantmakers in Health, she served as vice president for pro excuse me, Dr. Mitchell is a senior, was a senior program officer at the Institute of Medicine, where she was responsible for health disparities portfolio. Dr. Mitchell spent 12 years at the National Academy, both at the IOM and as a center director for the Division of Social and Behavioral Science and Education. She's held numerous leadership positions at the U.S. Department of State, the San Francisco Foundation, and the William and Flora Hewitt Foundation. And as it is a dialogue, uh, for those people who are on the webcast, there is an opportunity to ask questions by typing them into the box on the web screen that I can't see from here, but you can see on your webcast. We will accumulate the questions both from the audience here in the room and from the webcast uh, to, to be able to present common themes around some of the questions that people might have for the panel. So. Without further delay, I'd like to get to the real experts who are here today and um, introduce Linda Joe Doctor as our first speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks so much for the invitation to participate on this panel. Thank you to the Altarum Institute, to co-sponsors Grant Makers in Health, and the American Society for Nutrition. For many of us here, it is unique to see in such a short time and innovation such as Healthy Food Incentives, where SNAP program participants have the option to use the federal food benefit at farmers markets with up to double the value to purchase locally sourced fruits and vegetables, take hold, spread, and now have the potential for scale up. For the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, food and health have been core to its work since the founding of the foundation by Will Keith Kellogg 83 years ago. Today, we envision a nation that assures that all children, all children, have an equitable and promising future and where all children thrive, a mission that creates the conditions that propel vulnerable children to achieve success. The Good Food Continuum, one key system that impacts the health and well-being of our children, families, and communities is our food system, from production to consumption, from farm to fork. The good food pr continuum provides a context. First food, the importance of mother's milk for health and development. Early food, young children at home in early care and education settings. School children, 
community food, developing the infrastructure and pathways to access points, farmers markets, farm stands, mobile markets with EBT access, where SNAP program participants can purchase fresh local food being a key component of a community food system and a viable place for low-income residents to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables. What is good food? Food that is healthy, food that is green, grown through eco-friendly and sustainable practices, food that is fair, where all along the value chain, production, retail, workers receive fair pay and benefits, and food that is affordable, a viable price point where quality and fair pay for farmers is not compromised. <coughs> Why promote healthy food inf incentives? We have found it's a three-way win. It increases access to healthy food, and while steer, still a new area of study, all of the findings to date indicate there's an increase in purchase of fresh fruits and vegetables and an increase in consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. And these are early studies supported by both Robert Johnson Foundation, the Boston Foundation, and in Michigan, Kresge Foundation and the Kellogg Foundation, and now Kaiser Permanente nationally. It helps to build the local food economy. It provides a stable source of income for farmers, and farmers' markets stimulate rural economies as a greater percentage of sales revenue is retained locally. And it strengthens community building connections between urban and rural areas, connecting consumers with local farmers, creating a safe space in neighborhoods where children and families connect and celebrate their community. The innovators. When innovation happens in multiple places, you pay attention. In 2004, the Bronx Farmers Market, with support from the New York State Health, City Health Department, initiate the first healthy food incentive program. They piloted the concept of a central swipe for EBT and usage of tokens to pay the farmers. In 2006 and seven, similar programs with the focus on locally and regionally sourced foods emerged in the Lynn Farmers Market, working with the Food Project in Massachusetts. The opening slide actually featured the young farmers running their food stand from the food project. And at Crossroads Farmers Market in Tacoma Park, with the Fresh Check Program, two projects support, supported by the Project for Public Spaces and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. The Fresh Check Program, now continuing at Crossroads, and also at Tacoma Park Farmers Market, both markets being the first in Maryland to accept SNAP, WIC, and senior assistance vouchers. The Fresh Check Program being the inspiration and model for three pilots that were implemented in Holyoke, Boston, and Detroit, and also San Diego, where community coalitions supported outreach and community engagement and partners such as the Fair Food Network provided leadership working with local farmers markets. The pilots supported by Wholesome Wave, also, also including San Diego. So you're starting to see now multiple partners get engaged. In 2009, the USD, USDA granted a blanket waiver to support this particular approach at farmers markets. And then, like wildfire, it spread today over 350 markets in over 25 states, anchored by key organizations, Fair Food Network, among them Wholesome Wave, Market Umbrella, Roots of Change. The list is getting longer and longer. The mayor of Boston picked up Boston Bounty Box, the state of California with Cal Fresh, Market Match in New Orleans, Produce Perks in Cleveland, and Double Up Food Bucks in Michigan which you'll hear more about shortly. This is philanthropy and local and state government at its best. It takes a public-private partnership to move this work. And now the possibility to scale up. And there is public support 
In April of 2012, the Kellogg Foundation commissioned a nationwide poll to survey views on access to fresh food, very similar to the views expressed by Lauren earlier when he started out. 93% of people surveyed said it was important that all Americans have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And 75% said they would support a national program to double the value of SNAP benefits when used at farmers markets. And over 80% said that Washington, D.C. should do something about it. Imagine what would it be like if all of our policies aligned with the USDA My, Late, My Plate dietary guidelines. <coughs> this is a great start. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to be with you this morning. I really appreciate the Altarum Institute and Grant Makers in Health and other partners for hosting this roundtable where, where we get a chance to uh, both share some of our work and, um, and hear what questions there are and, and think about how we uh, advance this work that uh, Linda Joe so effectively talked about how it got started and, and uh, the genesis of it. Um, I'm going to very specifically talk about the program in Michigan called Double Up Food Bucks. And uh, so first let me tell you how it works. Double Up Food Bucks is a program that provides an incentive, a one-for-one -one match incentive to any SNAP customer that comes to a participating farmer's market in the state to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables. So if I'm, uh, if I'm a SNAP customer, I bring my, in Michigan it's called the Bridge Card, our EBT is called the Bridge Card in Michigan. I bring my bridge card to the farmer's market where in most cases, not all, but in most cases, there's a central uh, kiosk with a uh, you know, snap machine, EBT machine. Swipe my card and I'll say, for example, I want to spend $20 today of my EBT money at the farmer's market. And you'll get handed uh, $20 worth of wooden or gold tokens to spend at the farmer's market. You will also get handed $20 worth of double up food bucks an actual coin, they're in $2 denominations, and this Double Up Food Buck is good for purchasing any Michigan-grown fruit or vegetable in that market. <laughs> so you can see we're encouraging SNAP customers to come to the market, to spend their SNAP dollars at the farmer's market, encouraging them to get more fruits and vegetables for their families, for their kids, and at the very same time, putting that very same dollar in the pocket of local farmers and the local food economy. So that, that's how it works. There's some variations that I'll talk about in a minute, but that's how it works at, at most farmers markets in the state. And these are, this shows you the locations now um, of the double up food bucks across Michigan. And I see uh, Rachel Bayer uh, came in who actually uh, runs our program in Michigan very effectively. So Rachel, how many locations do we have uh, going into 2013? 97. So 97 farmers markets around the state with a similar program branded the same way and uh, you can earn your incentives in Detroit and spend them in Grand Rapids or Traverse City. Now, we've never, uh, we've never believed that you can just build a program. You know, if you build it, they will come. Might work for a baseball stadium in Iowa. <laughs> but uh, I, we don't think it, it's going to work in farmer's markets. You have to let people know that you have a program in place. And so uh, along with Anthony Garrett, who's also here today, our, uh, one of our communications gurus in our program, um, we've really done a lot of communications about this, including direct mail. This is an example of an oversized postcard that gets sent directly to households of uh, SNAP beneficiaries. In fact, last summer, I think we had uh, close to 300,000 of these go directly to the homes of women with at least one dependent and receiving at least $100 of SNAP benefits a month. And we do this in our key locations around the state. Um, and we know it works because there's an 800 number on that card, and uh, we've now learned that when this card hits the mail, we better get our volunteers in the office because that phone will ring nonstop for about five days after the card's hit. So that's one way we do our communications. We also, last summer, had 50 billboards like this all over Detroit. So it's not about, uh, as Anthony has taught me, it's not, a, you know, it's not, not about doing any one thing in communications, it's about, it's about doing everything. It's really about letting people know. We, do ra we produce radio ads on urban radio in Detroit and other places and have a lot of other communications we use. Um, so uh, how, how has it worked? How has the program worked? 
Well, this, these are the results of Double Up Food Bucks in Michigan over the last three years. Um, by 2012, that big carrot represents about 90,000 customer visits to farmers markets in Michigan to use the program. And put uh, if, you, if you add both the um, Double Up and the SNAP expenditures, it's close to $2 million right in the pockets of Michigan farmers. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a common adage that says, uh, if you want to change behavior, you need a carrot and a stick. You've heard that before, right? Well, I think we're demonstrating that to change uh, eating behavior of SNAP customers, all you need is a better tasting carrot <laughs> and a bigger carrot. And we're showing you don't need the stick. All you need is the incentive, and it's working. Some of our core evaluation questions as we do this work are, we want to know what uh, these incentive effects are on the purchasing and consumption behavior of our SNAP customers, and what the effect of the incentive is on the sales and revenues from the vendors and the local economy. And um, you, you have, most of you got in your seat, this is a, an evaluation report. So you got a lot more information in there. If you want to know more, you can also go to our website at fairfoodnetwork.org and download copies of this. But in short, this is what we find from our customers. 78% um, say they're buying more fruits and vegetables because of the Double Up Food Bucks program. Um, buying more at the farmer's market, making more trips to the farmer's market, and very importantly, we think, buying more different kinds of fruits and vegetables. So the variety of fruits and vegetables that are being purchased and taken home are expanding because of the program. But as I said, it's equally important to us in this program about what's happening with the farmers. So here's what we find when we talk to the farmers who are vending at the farmer's markets. They're selling more fruits and vegetables, they're making more money at the market, uh, of course, you know, I don't know who that 1% is that said they don't want to participate again, but, you know, almost all the farmers saying, yeah, let's keep it going. And even though the, the percentages are low, it's significant that close to 30% of the farmers that we surveyed last year said they're expanding their acreage and growing a greater diversity of fruits and vegetables for this year because of the Double Up program. Their customer base is changing because of this program. And one reason we think this, uh, this making more money, earning more money from, from the local farmers is important, USDA tells us that um, local food systems generate about 13 jobs for every, every $1 million dollars in sales, where farmers who don't sell locally or regionally employ about three workers for every million dollars in revenue earned. So we believe that, in some sense, this incentive program is actually a job creation program. We're, you, we're, thinking of, we're, we're figuring out how to use SNAP dollars both for a nutrition purpose and for an economic development purpose. Now, this is, the, this is the growth in SNAP sales at farmer's markets in the state of Michigan. Uh, in 2007 was the first year we were really keeping records in Michigan on SNAP sales. Um, and you can see it was about $16,000 statewide. Double Up Food Bucks started in 2009, and you can see the growth there in the last three years. And um, while we were very pleased with this, it surprised us, actually, when last year we... Uh, we came across USDA data where they're looking at uh, SNAP sales at farmers markets now across the Midwest region, and this is what we found. So that's the last three years of SNAP sales at farmers markets in states in the Midwest region. So uh, when you see a chart like that, the, it kind of speaks for itself. Now, you know, I'm a scientist by training, so I would never tell you that there's a cause and effect here. I would never tell you that Double Up Food Bucks is the reason for that. But I would be the first to tell you that we believe that Double Up Food Bucks is a contributing factor. So the big question now is, is how are we going to scale this up? We know it works in every way we're, we're, uh, we're measuring it. And a couple of, uh, of uh, new innovations we're working on is actually uh, we know that, you know, as this scales up and it starts to spread across the country, uh, using tokens is going to have to go by the wayside because I'm not sure we're going to have uh, Brinks trucks driving around the country delivering tokens. I mean, right now, Rachel does it in the trunk of her car, but that's not going to last very long. <laughs> <laughs> so we are actually working right now uh, with partners in Michigan to develop mobile apps. Uh, this is the future of transaction processing at farmer's markets, right, where you don't go to a central kiosk where each farmer can transact business with the bridge card or EBT cards at their own stall. And so we are developing um, 
mobile apps for double up food bucks where in some cases customers instead of having tokens they'll have a card and on that card they will earn incentives spend incentives so it all becomes electronic transaction processing another way that we need to scale the program up is to think about how we move from farmers markets to the place where most people get most of their groceries most of the time and that's grocery stores and so we have what i believe is the first in the country a uh, pilot of this type happening in Detroit this summer where four independently owned grocery stores will be having double up food bucks for a four month period. And it's a, it's a pilot, we're testing it. We, uh, when when uh, Audrey comes, I will uh, thank her for the work that she did at USDA to help us get a special waiver to be able to do this program in the grocery stores. But we're looking forward to uh, what that is going to show us. We could not do this without a lot of different partners, and uh, this shows you some of the partners that we are working with in Michigan. The Michigan Department of Human Services, the SNAP Agency for the State, the Michigan Nutrition Network, uh, the Michigan Farmers Market Association, uh, Eastern Market is, in Detroit has been a really key partner, and of course, uh, W.K. Kellogg Foundation among about the 40 or so funders, foundation funders that are supporting this program in Michigan. So. Uh, I've talked to you a little bit about how we scale up in terms of logistics, but how you really scale up in terms of the funding is to start looking at how we're going to fund this, not only from philanthropy, but also from public sources. And while we know that uh, Congressional Budget Office tells us that about 80 percent of all of farm bill spending over the next 10 years is going to be nu to, for nutrition programs, par primarily for SNAP, um, we need to think about how to use that money more effectively. If you, if you wonder whether there's room for expansion of these programs, uh, all you need to do is look at this map, which shows state by state the percentage of overall SNAP dollars being spent at farmers markets. Right? Now, we're proud that Michigan is one of the leaders, but it's still 0.051% of total SNAP expenditures. We just did a little calculation to figure out that if, um, if um, SNAP users, SNAP customers spent their money at farmers markets at the same percentage as the overall population, there's about $133 million on the table for, for farmers nationwide. If, they, if SNAP customers were just buying at the same level as the rest of us in the population or the overall population. So there's a lot of room for expansion. And ultimately, the way we're going to do this is through changes in public policy. And so uh, I'm very pleased to say that as the Senate is marking up, the Senate Ag Committee is marking up their farm bill today, I'm very, very pleased that our Senator Debbie Stabenow, who is chair of that committee, um, is supporting, is really the leader uh, nationally and the policy leader in supporting um, starting to bring public dollars to uh, the SNAP incentive programs to match the philanthropic dollars and other local dollars that are on the table. And that we are hopeful that if her leadership continues and uh, she's able to find the compromise that we know is going to be needed to get things done here in Washington, that by the end of this year, we will actually be able to say we have an, a new program that we'll get to start working with that is going to help scale this uh, approach of SNAP incentives uh, to many more communities throughout the country and in many more venues because we know it's a program that works. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with you today and look forward to our conversation afterwards. Thank you, Oren, Lauren, Linda Joe, and Faith. Sounds like a, some sort of a music combo here. But uh, I don't want you to think this is a Michigan conspiracy, but I also went to college in Michigan. So even though I'm from Kansas, there are three Michiganders here. So I'm proud of what the folks here have done to try to scale up this program. Let me first start by just telling you, I, I have many hats in this game, uh, con former congressman, former secretary of agriculture, and my, uh, my position here is uh, as, as a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center, although I'm also chairman of FRAC, the board of FRAC, and with a group called AGREE, which is also dealing with these issues as well. But the BPC is a group standing what it what it basically says, a place to try to encourage bipartisanship in government and realizing that's tough to do today, but we are doing our best. Um, next slide. We have recently uh, commissioned a, a an undertaking uh, initiative on nutrition and physical activity where we had four former secretaries of agriculture, myself, Donna Shalala, Ann Veneman, 
and uh, Mike Levitt, two Republican and two Democrat, that produced this report, which I don't know if we have copies of here, but we can get copies for anybody who wants them. We examined food and farm policy as major cross-cutting themes. And uh, historically, farm and agriculture policies were at most tangentially influenced by considerations of nutrition and health. And this separation is beginning to wane. The silos between farmers and health providers were very, very rigid. And it's one of the things that uh, we're doing our best to change and what folks uh, on the ground are doing to change as well. We have an obesity epidemic. If you look at this particular slide, it will show the massive increases in obesity between 1990 and 2010. Percentage of adults and children with chronic obesity rates. Uh, in the last 30 years, we have two-thirds of adults and one-third of children obese or overweight in this country. And obesity is related to a host of health care problems. I don't have to tell you, particularly diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and arthritis. And most of these problems are modifiable. But the fact is, is the economic linkages between agriculture policy and health care costs are often ignored. So if we could go to the next slide. Health care is the dominant factor in the debt. So when you hear all about our national debt and where our problems are, the only thing that's really going up is health care costs, particularly for people my age and older. Chronic disease, people living longer, is the primary reason why folks are talking about the deficit and the debt today. Virtually everything else is either flat or going down except health care costs. So I don't have to tell you that what we're talking about today is extraordinarily important, not only for farmers and ranchers and communities, but for our livelihoods, longevity, aging process. And um, so what we spend on uh, being healthy is mostly in the area of medical devices. Almost 90% of what we spend on being healthy is to doctors and hospitals and pharmaceutical companies. And you look at what really makes us healthy is what and how we eat, the environment that we're involved with, and of course, nutrition and physical activity as well, which was a big part of, of our report. So I talked to you about this because what we're talking about today has its foundation on the health of the country, the, the deficit, the fiscal issues of our country, as well as the health of agriculture. So first of all, let me just start with talking a little bit about SNAP. And as uh, the folks before me have talked about, there has been a uh, great deal of discussion today because the Congress is marking it up. SNAP is a critically important program, and I agree completely with the New York Times editorial today, is now is not the time to be cutting this program at a time when the country is still very economically vulnerable. But because our federal nutrition programs, such as SNAP, touch nearly one in four Americans, they provide a critical opportunity for educating people about the connections between diet, physical activity, and health. And I just want to spend a little bit of time discussing the a few opportunities we identified in our June report to better align SNAP with considerations of nutrition and health, which our previous two speakers are right in the middle of. SNAP has evolved significantly over the years. It started out at food stamp program as a temporary stopgap distribu distributing excess commodities. That was the purpose of it. And it's now become a long-term support system for tens of millions of families, particularly families with small children, working families, and the elderly. And this makes it all the more important that federal nutrition programs, including SNAP, not only reflect but support federal dietary guidelines. In our report, we recommended several ways the USDA could use its nutrition assistance programs to promote health. They're pretty detailed. But I'll, I'll let you read the report for yourself. But generally speaking, they reflect the following. First, USDA should improve the alignment of messaging and education about nutrition through federal nutrition assistance programs. Despite the fact that many federal nutrition assistance programs serve many of the same client, clients, current regulations can hinder effective implementation by limiting agencies' abilities to share information and educational materials. Second, Congress should continue sustained support for relevant research by offices of USDA. At BPC, we strongly believe in the need for empirical data underpinning sound policy decisions. So far, 
there is no recent comprehensive government study that's been conducted to quantify what is currently being perched with SNAP dollars or to analyze the policy effectiveness and implementation issues that might be raised by different program changes designed to shift recipients' food consumption patterns. I'm not arguing that we should do anything specifically here. I am saying that we ought to do the research and find out what people are actually eating. Both SNAP, uh, other nutrition programs, and the population as a whole. Such, as such studies are critically important as reforms are considered to program design, administration, and cost. Uh, education and research are important, but they can't be put into practice if there is not access to affordable, healthy foods. And that's what I've just heard from Oren. My friend Gus Schumacher is out here with Wholesome Wave as a former member of Congress and as a USDA secretary. My, one question I have is, how do we scale up these programs to get tens of millions of Americans involved, not just the numbers that we've got here? That's the key right now, because we know what they're producing are the things that we ought to be adding to our diets. The question is, how do we get from here to there? And as uh, Oren said, one of the ways, of course, is the federal government going to have to look at how it allocates money in nutrition programs and put more dollars into the kinds of things that encourage the consumption of, of, of fresh fruits and vegetables. I would say that in the public-private partnership area, food banks and feeding agencies, such as those in Feeding America, are another key player in providing food and education uh, to the food insecure. And they are increasingly working to improve the nutritional profile of the food that they serve. So there are a whole assortment of incentives that we need to be looking at to increase purchase of fruits and vegetables by SNAP recipients. And to do so, however, we really do need better data on what people are actually eating and how we can evaluate ways to improve that diet. Now, I don't have to tell you about the politics of America right now. We have this horrendous problem, a fiscal problem in this country, caused largely, as I said, by increase in health care costs. And at the same time, we have hungry people who need the assistance of the federal government. By the way, we ought to be proud as a nation that we have the largest food uh, supplement system in the world, in the United States of America. With all the issues that we have, we provide a safety net for food that nobody else in the world provides. So that's a good thing what we're talking about. At the same time, uh, our food supplemental system is included in a piece of legislation called the Farm Bill. And the Farm Bill has been largely driven in the past by traditional agriculture interests. That is, how much we should pay farmers to largely grow wheat, corn, soybeans, rice, and cotton. Now, Congress is now considering how best to manage that and reduce the cost of the program at a time when farm prices are better than they've been in a long time. We have to make sure that the income supplement and nutrition programs are not axed as a part of this effort to look at this long-term uh, agriculture program that both helps farmers and helps folks who need uh, uh, the help so desperately. But I would tell you at a time of deep fiscal problems, this coalition between the producers of food and the consumers of food is now needed more than ever. The, the, the rural urban coalition that was developed years ago by senators like Humphrey, Dole, McGovern, the, the uh, partnership that developed between farmers and those who need the help during times of economic distress is one that we do not want to lose because if we lose that coalition, I think both food producers as well as those who need uh, additional food assistance will both suffer in the process. So in closing, I want to emphasize a couple, three things. Number one is doing our best to keep SNAP cups to a minimum, if at all. I think that's really paramount to the discussion because of the fact that we have 47, 48 million Americans on the program now is representative of the thing that our economy's in tough shape. We're coming out of this situation slowly, but a lot of folks would be hurt by cuts. Second of all, em emphasizing the importance of proper nutrition as part of these programs, not only scaling up 
the things that we're talking about by Oren and Linda Joe and others and Gus, but also to make sure that we have the facts and the data to help us understand what is policy we ought to be doing in the future. We know that Washington alone does not have all the answers. States and localities, foundations, philanthropies, advocacy groups, and more and more the private sector and business will all have a role to play. There is a need for the hunger and obesity communities to work together with agriculture, health, and the budget communities in Congress and the state governments to address these issues in a comprehensive way. Uh, so I would just close by saying it's, it's a great honor to be here. It's a great honor to have participated in the development of these programs to recognize the importance of not only traditional production agriculture, but the role that the income supplement programs and the food nutrition programs have maintained, have helped to maintain an America that uh, is, uh, helps not only the poor, but helps people live a better life to, so they can grow out of poverty because poverty is the main reason why these numbers have been going up and in the process having a healthier America as well. Thank you all very much. Hi, I'm Faith Mitchell from Grant Makers in Health. Unfortunately, it looks like Audrey Rowe didn't make it, so I'm just going to start with the questions and answers, and perhaps if she comes, I'll stop or something. I have to kind of play it by ear. So my first question, um, <coughs> as one who works with health funders, is I'm wondering if people have additional ideas of ways um, health foundations, philanthropy can support um, healthy eating by SNAP recipients. Um, in addition to Double Up Bucks, which is a great program, um, I'm thinking in particular of like consumer education. So SNAP recipients, you know, getting information to them using foundation support so that they have a better understanding of health, healthy food. I just wonder if any of the panelists have any ideas about that. And Lauren, I would even include you. You may have some suggestions too. Yeah. So I would say that there's a lot of this work that's already happening, and I would actually expand it a bit and say it's more than actually the traditional education approaches. And we're seeing that what's tracking in community is supporting community activists as leaders. And as leaders, understanding the relationships between what is happening in the economy, what's happening in our healthcare system, the impact of chronic diseases, the role of the food system in relationship, and what innovations and opportunities are there to build a healthier food system. And by engaging in that process, what we're seeing are community leaders becoming advocates in their own community, providing leaderships. In Detroit, we actually have groups that are hosting sessions Saturday morning in libraries run by neighborhood leaders. And uh, leaders speaking to leaders, neighbors to neighbors, and learning together. And then what we're seeing are folks getting engaged, and at the same time, individual behaviors are changing. So it's a bit of a, a different approach. I think I, a lot of the lessons that we've learned from work internationally around expanding the concept of education to a broader leadership development and um, opportunities. That's great. I, I guess I would add that from some of our research, we've seen some very innovative approaches that have tied government programs to philanthropic efforts to increase healthy eating, such as the funding of le uh, edible landscape projects in low-income housing centers, and the uh, healthy corner store initiatives, such as right. the ones the Food Trust works on in Philadelphia, and, and others. And I think that keeping that close tie between the nutrition programs themselves and the policy development around those programs and the philanthropic efforts and the efforts of the community organizations that work is absolutely key to, to sort of sustaining this sort of ongoing uh, promotion of, of healthy eating. Thank you. Can I yeah. jump in mm -hmm. one more? I would also say another, what we're seeing around the country is young people that are getting engaged. They're asking where the food is coming from. And we are seeing a flurry of community gardening, urban ag, efforts that are run by young people, a, a very racially and ethnically diverse group of young people across the nation. They're asking hard questions, 
and they're then becoming a part of this revitalization. And through the process, they're learning both about becoming young uh, new farmers and actually educating uh, and, uh, uh, and supporting uh, 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 communicating messages around this work in their communities. You know, when, we've, uh, when we've looked at, done the research looking at from the perspective of residents in low-income communities, what are the greatest barriers to healthier eating? Uh, I mean, the two big ones are access and affordability. They always, they always come up as the two huge ones, whether it's a telephone town hall meeting we do or whether it's actual focus groups we're doing. So I think two very specific things that philanthropy mm -hmm. can, can be focusing on. Um, helping with, with programs like uh, Healthy Food Finance Initiative, so we get more uh, healthy food retail outlets in those communities. And the second is actually looking at transportation policy. Mm -hmm. So right now in Detroit, for example, we're starting to look at, you know, ask the question, what would it take to get more direct public transportation mm -hmm. routes to both farmers markets and healthy food retail outlets? I would just uh, welcome. Uh, <laughs> relax, relax. <laughs> uh, I would say two things. One is, uh, I served as chairman of the Institute of Medicine panel on uh, accelerating progress in obesity prevention. And it was clearly, physical activity has to be a key critical component part of this whole issue that you can't just look at intake alone. You have to look at outtake as well. And uh, that's a, uh, I, I'm not sure that the, what I found the foundations were not as involved in the physical activity sphere. There are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but the second thing is the role of the schools. Uh, the, 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 what USDA did in terms of changing uh, meals uh, in schools has a lot to do with setting patterns for life. And kids do come home and encourage their families to eat better. Uh, the third thing I would just say, we're working at Bipartisan Policy Institute with the Pentagon. Uh, the Defense Department is one of the largest institutional purchasers of food in the United States. And as people move in and out of military service, uh, what they eat there has a lot to do, they become role models all through society. And they can have a lot to do with, enc with encouraging better diets and, and better nutritional behavior. Thank you. So Audrey, I'm gonna turn the mic over to you. Welcome, I'm glad you were able to join us. I don't know, and since you're so far into it, let me just pick up on some things and anyone who wants my presentation, they can get access to it, I would assume. First of all, good to see Oren here. And, and certainly uh, listening to the Secretary talk about um, physical activity. I just attended a conference in Ohio where we looked at the relationship between cognitive learning, uh, eating, and physical activity. Mm -hmm. um, and the data clearly indicates that there is a direct relationship mm -hmm. between, for children, having, first of all, uh, a meal in the morning, um, having breakfast, having me access to meals in the schools, but equally important with physical activity. Because both together, principals and teachers and others anecdotally are saying they see a real difference in both performance and in the management of the classroom. The cafeteria piece of staff prefer students to have their meals before, recess before meals. Oh, okay. Re recess before meals rather than after be because, again, the cafeteria management in terms of children being able to be relaxed and to, um, um, and you know, just participate and follow the rules is much greater, greater enhanced uh, as a result of that. But so I just wanted to piggyback on, on that. There's a lot of research and work going on. I don't need to talk to you about our special nutrition programs. Uh, many of you in this room probably are well aware of the programs that we have. Uh, SNAP right now serves about 47 million participants, with half of which are children. And one of the things that's interesting about the changes in the SNAP program is um, when I started in social services and human services and working on these programs years ago, uh, the large majority of participants were also participating in other, in, in what was then called entitlement programs. Today, the majority of the participants in our SNAP program, 47%, are working. So while we are seeing changes in the economy and people going back to work, they're still not making enough in terms of their um, income 
from work to be able to put food on their table and they remain eligible, maybe for fewer benefits, but they do remain eligible for our programs. Um, when I, when Aaron first started talking to us about things that he was interested in doing, and we've talked to other folks, one of the questions that I started to look at is, well, what is the economic um, outcome for the investment and the benefits that we provide to, in general, throughout, overall, but also by state? Let me just throw out a couple of stats, which I think are important. We provided in, 19, uh, in 2012, 74 billion in benefits. Now, if I look at how those benefits and just take the top 10 cities um, for, and this is 2011 data, for New York, um, about 3 billion, for Chicago, a billion, uh, Houston, 700, over 700, thousand, um, you know, the lowest number in Baltimore was $442,000. So that's the amount of money that ends up in the economy as a result of SNAP benefits. Million dollars. Million dollars. I'm sorry, did I say that? Million dollars. I work for the government for Yeah, myself, I'm sorry. So I <laughs> get that up there. I'm still. Uh, um, so it's 442 million, uh, 3.2 billion was um, the amount for New York City. So, you know, people like Gus Schumacher, who came and asked us to take a look at some of these numbers so that we could understand what resources people had in communities, but more importantly, how communities could start to rethink um, access to food and the quality and the quantity of food that they have available in various communities and what I would consider to be, you know, food desert communities or those communities where the corner store is probably the place, although I just came from Appalachia uh, last week and I will tell you, um, going from one location to another, um, I may have I noticed one store um, in a four or five, eight mile uh, travel, uh, and it just reminded me of while there are food deserts and we see them in urban centers, when you go to rural centers, it's a very different situation. It's access is a very serious issue. Um, when we look at the dietary guidelines for Americans, again, we keep hearing all the time that we need to do something about SNAP recipients and restrictions, and we have incentive programs, and we're looking at. So again, for me, my question was, how different are the is the behavior of SNAP participants from those who do not participate in, in SNAP? And the Healthy Eating Index uh, indicated that 58% um, on average versus 42% of SNAP participants are actually meeting the Healthy Index um, eating requirements um, and what they have in place. There is low intake on for all groups on whole grains, dark greens, oranges, orange vegetables, legumes, etc. The differences in the diets of lower and higher income people is very small. So what we think is important is to continue to provide incentives. Uh, the double coupon programs that exist anytime I talk about them when I'm traveling around, uh, state governments and foundations and others are interested how they can get engaged. The hospitals are now and docs are now doing prescription mm -hmm. uh, coupons. Uh, those are also taking on. And so we're seeing that we're providing some of the resources to individuals. The other part of the equation then is the access. And so farmers markets and programs like corner stores or programs like Orange and others that are emerging in communities is becoming a way of closing that access. And so why don't I stop with that uh, and respond to questions rather Can than... Can I ask continue. you a question? Sure. Would you mind? Sure. You said that 58% of the American people as a whole are meeting the... In, uh, dietary intake. Dietary intake and 42%. The healthy eating index. 42% of SNAP recipients. 52. Oh, 52, so 52. it's fairly close. Yeah. Uh, so, so it looks to me like uh, we have an overall problem in this country. That's correct. And uh, with, with all categories. So That's correct. So are, are you working on that as well, too? Through, <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> through CN, through uh, the Center on Nutrition and po uh, Program and Policy, um, there are a number of initiatives that they have underway. If you haven't 
uh, look down their website. If you don't look at my plate and then Super Tracker, um, that Super Tracker now, we have Super Tracker on college campuses, Super Tracker. Um, they were desi designing one that can be accessed on iPhones, et cetera. It helps people look at what they're eating, how they're eating, how that relates to the amount of intake. I tried it one day and I thought I had done a really good job of eating very healthy. And I put in everything I needed that I ate that day. My sodium intake was off the chart. Um, and I hadn't thought about, I ate a lot of processed food that day. Um, and even though it was healthy processed food, it was still processed food and had a lot of sodium in it. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll just tell you, Audrey, that what we're doing is I'm getting questions from the web, and then okay. people can also ask at the mic. Um, and I'm going to start actually with a comment, um, because it, it responds to um, Dr. Glickman's call for more research. Uh, someone wrote in just to say that the USDA's Economic Research Service, with support from the Food and Nutrition Service, has sponsored a house household survey that collected data on all food acquisitions by all household members over a seven-day period. Data from this national food study, also called Food Apps, um, are currently being cleaned and processed and will become available to researchers next year. So that's Absolutely. one to let yes. folks to know that. That's good, and I'm not a doctor, so don't okay. get sick in this oh, room. Okay, sorry. <laughs> don't follow your advice. So um, I'm going to start with some questions that came in from the web, and not surprisingly, there was a lot of interest in Double Up Bucks. So um, a couple to start you with, Oren. Um, what is the evidence that these incentives for purchasing food, fruits and vegetables at farmers markets actually increase overall daily consumption of fruits and vegetables? Um, and I'm going to tie that to someone who asked, have you found after the incentive dollars go away, do customers with EBT still shop at farmers markets? Okay, good, good questions. Okay. Um, so the, the question on consumption is really key. I mean, we know purchasing behavior is changing. Mm -hmm. The big question now, there's really two questions that, that sort of have to link this with what, what Dan, you were talking about. And one is, um, does, in per does changes in purchasing behavior lead to changes in consumption behavior? And then if that's the case, what kind of changes is that going to be making in health outcomes longer term? And we are actually starting that uh, piece of research with Kellogg Foundation support right now in Detroit to actually look at a smaller subset to ask that question, those, both of those questions. Now, there's some indication when you ask people, uh, is your consumption changing? You know, the indications are, yes, it is. But we know we have to go deeper than just uh, simply asking at a farmer's market. So a, a key question that we're getting into. Um, in, at those uh, markets, and there are some markets that, that do incentives for part of the time and then not incentives for part of the time, and the indications there seem to be that, that there's some level of, of increased purchase of uh, fruits and vegetables that stays there. But, you know, I, I, I actually think it's asking the wrong question in a way. That the way we need to be asking the question is really, what is it going to take to ensure that we are using our food assistance dollars in ways that are creating a healthier population overall, healthier individuals, healthier kids, and a healthier population. Mm -hmm. And we know that by having these incentives in place, it works. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd be asking, the question I'd be asking is, what's it going to take to get what has been a tiny, uh, a tiny uh, really demonstration of this through philanthropic dollars, what's it going to take to really scale that up to a much larger, That's the larger scale? That's the question we need to be asking. And uh, I just want to also add to that, we do have the Healthy Incentives Pilot, mm -hmm. uh, which the USDA and FNS we ran in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, the pilot just ended. We have some, uh, certainly our interim data. Um, that question we're going to be looking at, what, what behavior changes resulted in the effort that we had to, did undertake. But let me tell you another piece of data. Again, it's anecdotal. I picked it up last week. Uh, visited a farmer's market in an area called Logan, Ohio. Uh, one of the things that we discovered is while they, have, they accept SNAP benefits, they don't have uh, a double uh, coupon program. However, in talking with the farmers there, they started accepting SNAP last, uh, year before last. Between year before and last year, they saw a doubling right. of the right. amount of purchases 
with SNAP benefits for fresh fruits and vegetables. So again, it's an, an, an anecdotal indication that if people have access, they will spend their SNAP benefits on healthy fruits and vegetables. One of the things that's always interested me is, is that since 95% of the food or 98% of the food is sold through uh, uh, grocery chains, um, one of the focuses has to be on what the commercial suppliers of food, where virtually all these, I mean, I hope that you're scaling up so you and Gus and others are supplying 25 million people in the, in the next three or four years. But practically speaking, what do we do to get the traditional suppliers of food, who, where most of the people who use SNAP benefits, to start following the more of the healthy plate, uh, right. you know, and, and, and doing the kinds of things. Now, it strikes me, one of the things you, you're doing is creating an atmosphere out there where people kind of believe that uh, they, if they get the taste of fresh fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. or fruits and vegetables, not just all fresh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because at the, at, you know, at frozen in many cases is just as healthy, without question. That's correct. But, uh, but uh, how do we get this 97% on the current scenario to be also begin doing their jobs as well, in addition to supporting you? And that's the role of the commercial grocery chains, Walmarts, Costco's, mm -hmm. and others in this process. Well, you know, one of them, uh, Kevin just shared with us last week, he was in uh, Texas, and um, uh, one of the Walmarts in Texas, and I'm trying to remember, some place right outside of Dallas, um, had decided that what they were going to do was to create a WIC store mm -hmm. inside the Walmart, which then, may, and that anyone, WIC participants, it was targeted to, but anyone who wanted to come into that, st into that part of the store and make purchases they could, and they were encouraging SNAP participants to use the WIC store for mm -hmm. single easy item purchases. So someone who was coming in, it's right up front, you don't have to go through all of the sweet sodas and all of the other things in the store, it's right up front, it's easily access accessible. So if you wanna walk in and have some uh, milk, you can also then have some other healthy foods that are uh, part of the uh, WIC program in that area. <laughs> HEB is looking at some and an, and an incentive program more than anything else related to the amount of purchases that someone makes of healthy items, um, and they've defined what they consider to be healthy items. Once they receive their receipt at the end, they also get coupons to buy additional healthy items the next time they come in the store. So some soup large stores are starting to say, we've got a responsibility here and we need to think out of the box and be creative. And so we're seeing incentives beginning, uh, programs beginning to emerge that are similar to the rewards programs that all of us um, participate in. And I would say that is happening both with the independent grocery stores in communities, which tend to be more in the low-income neighborhoods, and also the larger grocery chains. And we're seeing relationships with farmers groups at the local level. So I think also um, where Oren explained earlier, the pilot project now happening in, in Detroit with healthy food incentives in the retail market, I think there's an extraordinary opportunity there. I'm and going to go to another question just because they, they keep coming in. There's a lot of interest. Several people have asked how the Double Up Bucks program is funded and how they could start one in their state. Yeah, I mean, we get that, we get that question a lot. It's a great question. So right now it's funded by literally about 40 different foundations. Um, so it's, it's, all, it's like 98% you know, philanthropic dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's everything from you know, Kellogg Foundation and Kresge and Open Society Foundation, some of the large ones, to increasingly we're finding community foundations. Mm -hmm. And, and significantly to me is, you know, having worked in philanthropy and food systems for most of my career, community foundations that may have never funded anything in food and agriculture, have never seen themselves as funding and food systems work, understand this program. And so we've got a number of community foundations uh, throughout the state of Michigan. Uh, United Way is now starting to support this program. Lots of different ways to do it. Um, uh, and my belief is still that um, knowing philanthropy as I do, there is always a, uh, there's always an appetite for new programs for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really, really critical for us to get some public 
funding into these programs so we have a really robust public-private partnership happening. And I think that becomes the one of the answers to the question of people mm -hmm. asking, how do we start in our community? Um, foster those relationships with, with philanthropy and support the move to get public funds to, to match it as well. Great. Any questions from the room? Yes, okay. Um, my question is uh, for Oren Hesterman as well. Uh, my name is Douglas Stewart. I'm with, excuse me, I'm with the Piedmont Environmental Council. We are working with farmers all over the Piedmont region from Loudoun County down to Charlottesville. Uh, and mainly our focus is on increasing their production, getting them to scale up, introducing them to new markets. So the one of the threads of this conversation about how food access and healthy food is really an issue for all of us, not a particular segment of the population certainly resonates with us. We want to make food, local food more accessible and affordable for everyone. Um, in dealing in working with market managers through our Buy Fresh Buy Local program, uh, the the feedback we've gotten a lot is in in, in respect to the uh, the um, SNAP and um, the using the wireless machines. We've seen a great the the community philanthropies are engaged and interested in funding this. But uh, there seems to be a disconnect with, we're working with many part-time market managers who uh, are, don't seem, they, they are having uh, difficulties using this one point of purchase wireless machine model. So when you were talking about the swipe uh, mobile uh, technologies being introduced and uh, we, uh, I was very excited to hear that. And I wonder if you could talk a bit more about how that technology development is going and what opportunities there might be for, for our um, stakeholders to use it. I mean, I, I think when you talk about uh, access at farmers markets, especially with EBT, but it goes with people who have any kind of uh, electronic processing they want to use, um, really updating the transaction <laughs> processing ability of vendors at farmers markets is really key. And the, the good news is, the technology is there. This is not a complicated fix. The technology is there. It's you know called an iPhone, a smartphone, uh, Android. They can all be used. Um, and um, there's one company that has been approved by USDA, um, Novadia Group. They've created a an app. Rachel, I'm gonna try to get it right. Uh, Mobile Market Plus, yes. right? Yes. So Mobile Market Plus is an app that any farmer can download and actually use to process EBT on their smartphone. And uh, if all goes as planned by middle of July, that Mobile Market Plus will actually have integrated into it a double up food bucks mm. function. So that uh, any, so we start to take the burden of managing counting tokens and reimbursing farmers <coughs> off of the shoulders of market managers, many of whom are either volunteered or part time and actually uh, engage the farmer, the vendor directly in being able to manage their transactions with EBT. Super. I, I just you. want to add that one of the things that we're looking at, um, because this issue has come up a number of times, is we're now looking at our um, ability to fund um, either within the existing uh, authorization we have for expansion of EBT into farmers markets or in our next budget much more flexibility so that we can provide whatever kind of funding may be necessary to allow for these new um, up, up devices and approaches to come into the farmer's market. So we're trying to make our money as flexible as we possibly can, and we're laying uh, some foundation by meeting with a number of, of uh, organizations, uh, companies who are engaged in this area to determine what we should be asking for in our 2015 budget, because we're having to start think about that in terms of uh, EBT access. And th that'll be huge once we can get that uh, I, I just uh, also, uh, I don't know, I, you know, I've talked to Gus many times about his program and about the, the uh, prescriptions. Mm -hmm. how, how much are we involving the medical community, the <laughs> health insurance community, mm -hmm. the physicians, the medical providers, in all this stuff, if we believe, as I do, that the biggest mm -hmm. crisis we face as, face as a country, fiscally and economically, is health care, yeah. then this seems to be a natural to involve that segment. Mm -hmm. I know Kaiser mm -hmm. has been one of those actively mm -hmm. involved. I don't know how much are involved in SNAP, right. 
but they've been very oh. much involved in, in uh, the whole fruits and vegetables and, world. So, And I know Blue Cross is engaged in it. Um, as we are traveling around, again, this is another area that we've become very interested in meeting with hospital mm -hmm. um, uh so groups, yes. uh, hospitals that are interested in what can mm -hmm. they do. Right. Um, we're beginning to have some conversations uh, with a number of hospitals, and the suggestion to them is that they work with community groups and create mm -hmm. funding streams. Mm -hmm. You know, hospitals get bought and sold, and then they have to create this fund of money that right. needs to be used for community service. So let's turn that community service money into some of these uh, prescription, coupon, uh, prescription bucks. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's actually happening on the ground now. Hospitals, California, Michigan, other parts, other parts of the country were, are sites that are hosting farmers markets where healthy food incentives are involved. Doctors are getting involved as champions. They're beginning to see the connection between food and nutrition and health, nurses, <laughs> dietitians. So there's a huge shift that's, that's happening. I think there's opportunity um, across a number of federal agencies. Uh, this works perfectly for uh, their uh, health care pr providers now getting engaged in prevention, Medicaid, Medicare. This mm -hmm. is a perfect opportunity to support this kind of work in, in the opportunity. And there is return on the investment. And um, so I think exploring these opportunities, where, which is actually happening in, com in communities, and also I'll add here philanthropy. We are seeing a change in philanthropy, both in relationship to community what it takes to do this work, it's long-term. Seeing the con connections, wherever you lead, if it's health, if it's nutrition, if it's economic development, if it's agriculture and food systems, this is a way in, regardless of what might be the primary focus. So, um, and uh, we, uh, working with a number of other funders through the Convergence Partnership, there is work going on working with philanthropy, supporting these kind of transitions, because again, it's gonna take a public-private partnership to make this work. Yeah. You know, Aetna Foundation yes, is one of the on funders supporting yes. our evaluation yes. work now. Yeah. Yes. I have a couple of questions about SNAP outside of um, farmers markets. One person said, SNAP recipients are food bank pantry customers. How are we connecting the work of SNAP incentives and healthy initiatives with the work at food banks? And another person wanted to know about approaches for having SNAP benefits accepted at summer feeding programs. Um, on the latter, SNAP, I'm, I'm not quite sure what they mean by having SNAP benefits accepted, unless what they're talking about is if there's a summer feeding program that is not currently being funded um, for um, a family uh, that they are able to use their SNAP benefits. But if they're SNAP eligible, usually that program is already funded, so they have access. So I'm not quite sure what they mean by that question. Uh, in terms of um, food banks, I mean, I think... Uh, many of the food banks, um, Feeding America Food Banks and others, are putting forward a great deal of effort to increase options, information, healthy eating. I was just at one in, in Middle Ohio where they actually are now doing a diabetes packet mm -hmm. um, so that it's available to individuals who are diabetic. Um, and you can come in and get foods that are, di that are appropriate for your needs. Um, so food banks are starting to set up uh, special sections and areas where individuals who have hypertension can go and get low sodium food. So there's a lot, there's recognition uh, within the food bank community um, that they need to also be responsive to access to healthy eating and who's in one and they kind of pushed the sodas off to the side. Um, but, you know, they were still accessible if somebody wanted them. But they really promote a lot of the recipes that they're promoting. They've got my plate. Uh, we have asked that all of the food banks uh, have my plate and my plate information. So they are engaged very much in promoting healthy eating. Um, Gle Gleaners Food Bank in uh, Detroit in partnership with Fair Food Network and a couple of other organizations, we actually have a program called the Fresh Food Share, where uh, the food banks are, the food bank is distributing uh, basically like a CSA share, most of it coming from the Eastern market, and customers can use their SNAP dollars to buy it and earn double up food buck incentive dollars that they can either spend on next week's fair, uh, food box or they can take it to the farmer's market. So it's an example of how we're starting to integrate uh, programs with uh, with food banks. Great. Thank, thank you, panel. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Sonia Clay, and I'm with the American Academy of Pediatrics. So really pleased to hear um, about the interest in engaging the medical community. Um, I know the AAP has been really actively um, involved with the White House's Let's Move initiative, um, as well as working at a national level to promote nutrition uh, within the WIC program, as well as part of the school lunch program as part of the Healthy and Hungry Free Kids Act implementation. Um, but, I, you know, my comment is just that, you know, the issue of promoting nutrition and anti-obesity efforts, um, there's a strong interest within the AAP um, in this issue. And we've just started a healthy weight initiative in 2012. And um, we've been really actively involved in advocacy at the national level. Um, I'm really curious just to kind of continue the conversation um, in terms of what types of community-based programs make sense uh, for AAP members um, who are interested in this issue. And granted, AAP has a committee on nutrition, a section on o obesity, and a committee on community health. Um, so, and, and I know that every year we have an annual leadership forum where it's sort of like a mini Congress, and every year um, there's some sort of resolution um, focused on the promotion of nutrition and anti-obesity efforts. So at the highest level, there's certainly a lot of interest um, in terms of um, promoting nutrition and anti-obesity efforts, and there's certainly an understanding um, about the importance of increasing access to healthy foods because, again, our pediatricians see children with the onset of uh, adult diseases. Um, but I think that in terms of finding the right types of programs beyond just the advocacy and, and, and um, outreach efforts to Congress, what are some things that we could be doing? And also just a quick comment, really encourage you all to work really closely in the sort of southern, southeastern states. Um, just there's so much of a need in terms of those communities. And just to build on what you said, the food deserts um, are, are quite significant, um, both in the southeast as well as the southwest and some of the Native American communities. Can I, if I may just make a comment, because I'm delighted to hear what you said, but our BPC report exposed Virtu very few medical schools in this country mm -hmm. have any kind of training True. in nutrition. Right. More than they might learn what my plate is, mm -hmm. or somebody may come in and explain the dietary guidelines. But we found, at, at least as recently as a few years ago, less than 15% of the medical schools trained their, uh, uh, in their, in their four-year curriculum. Uh, any intensive training and we went down and visited one of these medical schools we went in and looked at the courses that were offered and uh, one of the students came out and they said well they wanted to show you this but said this is it there wasn't much else there so if your medical professionals aren't being trained then it's very hard for them to give it the attention now pediatricians are usually better trained and, and, and physicians and medical providers that treat the elderly have become better trained. But the entire medical system in this country, which is, is fee-based, it, it doesn't encourage uh, uh, the kind of um, uh, intensive understanding of a patient's personal health profile in order to get them uh, to uh, perform better. And so the whole doctor, healthcare provider, a nurse practitioner, nurses, the, that whole scene has to change dramatically because the first interface that somebody will have when they got a problem is with their health care provider. And if that person is not competent or has the time to try to help that person along or doesn't get reimbursed for it, which is another issue, as you know, uh, you know, we're kind of fighting a losing battle. That's the interesting thing when I talk about Gus, about the use of prescriptions and, and medical pro providers getting involved in, in understanding that a, a good diet is as important as a lot of, of um, exotic prescription drugs. So this is something we're going to continue to work on with medical colleges in this country and, and other uh, folks that train health care providers. They have to be integral parts of this problem because if they're not then it, people are just going to, massive numbers of people are going to escape through the system. Yeah, agreed. And let me just mm -hmm. um, comment. I was really very pleased. The conference that I just attended last week with uh, the Ohio Health and Hunger Advocates was also co-sponsored co by the American yeah. Pediatric yeah. Chapter there. Mm -hmm. um, and they were very much engaged. And I was really excited to see them involved because I've agree that we've got to get not only the medical community or the docs, as I call them, 
asking the question when they're discharging someone, do you have food at home to eat as you're taking these prescriptions? Um, and start having a way of connecting individuals at discharge with um, food banks or access to food that they can eat so that they can follow the discharge prescriptions and not come back in in a few weeks. The other issue is that we have been asking, we finally got Kevin, because uh, they wouldn't want to hear from me. So we finally got Kevin on the uh, conference agenda for the National Medical Association last summer, mm -hmm. and he was able to talk to the docs about the importance of them not only engaging in this area, but as part of any of the training that is going on, that we start training uh, physicians to understand nutrition, to understand health. Um, so I think, you know, it's slow. It's, it's almost, I feel like, you know, we're so peeling away an onion and we're very much on the outside, but that is, as you said, is a major piece that we've got to get to the core of because they are major players. And I was just really glad to see that the Pediat Academy of Pediatrics was engaged in this meeting. No, we're very passionate about this issue. So I would just add that I think pediatricians can play a critical role linking what's happening in medical care and clinical care in the office and what's happening in the community. Right. There are probably about, there are over now 3,000 community coalitions in the United States and in tribal nations. There's actually a website called Advancing the Movement that lists them, and every day new groups are signing up. And some of these organizations are supported by philanthropy, some by USDA, hunger-free communities, some by community transformation uh, partnerships, sustainable communities, all of them working on access for vulnerable children and families, all of them who would benefit from pediatricians getting engaged in being champions both locally mm -hmm. around what's going to maintain this work locally, what's going to maintain this work in the state, in the tribal nation, and nationally. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to ask Dan a quick question, and then I'm going to ask another one that came in from the web. Dan, you had that wonderful graphic of that showed um, the... the um, you know, it was the two things like um, where people, what makes people healthy on the left, and then on the right was like the, what we spend on yes. health. Yeah. Um, and the person asked, where did that come from? I wondered myself. Liesl. <laughs> this is Liesl Loy. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> we borrowed with permission <clears throat> the data for that graphic, that infographic from the Boston Foundation, which, as you know, has done a lot of work. They have a, a different way to depict that, and we wanted one punchy infographic, that's but that's where it comes from. Okay, thank you. So if we can, is it on their website, do you know, or um, on yours, maybe on your website? Well, it's in our report. It's in the 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 report. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This prior uh, work by Mike McGinnis that also... So the question is, um, since double up bucks can only be used at farmer's markets, and farmer's markets are mostly seasonal, are there similar incentives offered on a year-round basis? Um, you know, so in the off-season, um, is there something that people can use, which kind of ties in with Dan's comment about tapping into grocery stores? And a kind of related question, someone wanted to know, do you know if people who use double up bucks um, during, with farmers markets, kind of continue eating fruits and vegetables during the off season. Mm. So to speak. Right. Um, I mean, right now our program, and it's primarily because you know you have to budget uh, funding. Um, our program really has been a program at farmers markets. Most incentive programs, you know, they'll start at the beginning of the farmers market mm -hmm. season and at the end of the farmers market season. Part of what we need to be doing now is scaling this, not just scaling it up in terms of uh, where we're doing this, but sort of scaling it time-wise, because absolutely people need to be eating fruits and vegetables all year round, not just in the summer. The great thing about starting it at farmer's markets is it's helping people understand the seasonality of, of the fruits and vegetables and what's there, which I think you know, for the environment is a healthy thing, to be eating what can be grown locally. Um, there was a second. Whether Sorry. people continued, oh, if you know, which I think relates to your data gathering effort, like. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll learn more about this. So, something that we have found that is really intriguing is how people, are, people will use double up food bucks as a way to budget their mm -hmm. expenditures either over a month or over a season. There are folks that, that, have, that we know about that have come to farmer's markets and purchased uh, 
um, during the height of, uh, you know, uh, when tomatoes or green beans are there, use their double up bucks to purchase uh, a large quantity to then can or process or freeze for, you know, later in the season or during the winter. So, so people are using a variety of, of uh, strategies with the double up bucks. <coughs> Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Anthony Garrett from the Fair Food Network. This is a question for Secretary Glickman. And my question is, since you're the expert, uh, I would like to ask, what are the strategies and tactics that people in the healthy food incentives community can use <coughs> to get the attention of your former colleagues, uh, the, the people on Capitol Hill? Thank you. Well, you know, I mean, uh, it's tough these days, uh, I would have to say. Um, but, uh, but a couple of things. Number one is uh, local is better, bottom up is better than top down. So um, uh, if I were in your business, I would be doing everything I could to engage congressional staff at home as well as the members when they're home to actually physically see what you're doing. Uh, and uh, and in many congressional districts, that's possible. In most states, it's possible. But there needs to be a conscious effort. And there, you know, you have you have some organizations. There are a lot of advocacy organizations that do this right now. But in the line of work that you're in, it's it you don't have that benefit unless you can partner with advocacy organizations like FRAC or Feeding America does a fair amount of this now around the country because <coughs> people, a lot a lot of members of Congress will go to their food banks. That tends to be a central place where people will go. So maybe you work with food banks locally is, is a place uh, to engage in this effort. But, but I don't know if there's an association of, 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 of CSA-type organizations or not, but that would be another place. I think the foundations could be of help, too, in terms of devising strategies to communicate with key policymakers. It's not just members of Congress or their staffs. Uh, it's also uh, uh, role models in mm -hmm. communities around the country. Find out who are the leaders of your food banks, then go see them directly to get them engaged as well. I mean, there are a lot of ways to skin this cat. And finally, it's, it's the health community. I mean, that is really where this issue is moving, to make this a healthier society and a healthier country. And so that means health insurance. Mm -hmm. The corporate world now is finding that they lose enormous productivity by people who can't come to work because of a myriad of health problems, often caused by poor nutrition mm -hmm. as well. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily deal with the SNAP part of the situation, but it's, it's, it's related to it. So the strategies are no different here than they are any place else in terms of trying to get your policymakers Engage. The best way, however, is eyeball to eyeball, congressman or congresswoman going out and seeing how a program actually works. I know that's happened in Detroit mm -hmm. because I was just there <laughs> and everybody talked about the senators and the congressmen who actually have been involved in getting money for the program. Mm -hmm. And let me add one other thing. This is going to sound a bit cynical. I've been working too long. <laughs> um, I, it seems to me that the data doesn't resonate. We can have all the research we want. We can talk about the research, and it's important, but, but the stories of people who have benefited from mm -hmm. or who are still in need of need to be told. Um, and those are the, as I travel around, what I, rec what I talk to advocates and others about is to be able to take the stories, take the people when a congressional staffer comes in or there's a meeting, to talk to real people about how these programs have benefited. And so that there's an understanding that, you know, folks access these programs when they're in need. Um, and that the need is still out there, and therefore the funding for these programs needs to continue. Um, I, I saw a picture when I was in, um, as I said, I went into in Appalachia, uh, the rural areas. We've got to do get those stories out. 
I mean, there's a lot going on in those communities. I will tell you, I have, I was silent in the car for at least an hour after spending some time driving around and talking to people in the Appalachian area and seeing pictures of a house that had just been condemned the day before, which was an old shed, and it had four children and two adults. There is a, those are the stories that need to be told. Congress needs to understand, state legislators need to understand, state commissioners need to understand, because the other frustration of mine, which you're hearing, is that there is dollars, there are dollars that we send into the states, but we need state uh, agencies to look at and strategically use those dollars and leverage those dollars as their dollars are shrinking, being able to leverage those dollars to have people in the community benefit from these programs. So I think there is a great deal that we can do, but in addition to the data, we need to be able to tell the stories. Here's the good news, if there is good news. The good news is, is that I don't see a great groundswell of people who want to massively cut the, the, the programs. That is, I mean, that is true. here you have this farm bill that's being debated now and all the fiscal problems, and, and now who knows what might happen on, as the process goes forward. But uh, food is, is always had a different uh, level of support in this country. Uh, it's, it resonates with people. And, and so the good news is, is that most Americans don't want to decimate the programs. Yeah, but they and 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 because of that, I think most most politicians are sensitive to it. But they they just you have to constantly reinforce it. And I agree with you totally. It has to be done through stories. That's why I say eyeball to eyeball with whoever you want to talk to. Statistics don't really get it. Okay. Thank you very much. This was really helpful feedback from both of you. Thank you, panel. I'm going to ask one more question, and then hopefully that'll leave time for you. And I apologize to anybody on the web whose question wasn't asked. We, we got a lot in, and we've, we're just running out of time because it's a really rich topic. So um, we got a couple questions related to how the, I guess, regulations related to the SNAP program. One person asked, um, does limiting food purchases by not letting someone buy junk food with a SNAP card work? It is a very popular topic at the state capitol in our state. And then kind of related to that, someone asked, what is preventing the SNAP program from having requirements similar to those of the WIC program in terms of what is allowed to be purchased with SNAP dollars? Well, there is no evidence that limiting purchase of uh, restricting purchases of food is going to change is changing people's behavior. We do have evidence that incentivizing people, um, and again, it's anecdotal evidence, incentivizing people does result in behavioral change. And we have seen it in the schools where we have introduced healthier eating and kids are taking that home and parents are calling the schools trying to find out how they can have access to the fruits and vegetables and different menus that they have available. So it seems as though getting, having incentives and having availability is making a difference. With regard to the uh, SNAP program itself, I mean, we always have to go back to the purpose of the SNAP program. It was created to give individuals um, resources at a time when they had economic um, stress or economic uh, uh, challenges to be able to put food on their table. And it was designed so that it would, you could purchase what you bought when you had resources. You could make similar purchases except for certain kinds of restrictions um, when um, you didn't have those resources. Um, we're looking at a number of things to, again, incentivize uh, local stores, create options that are healthy on a local level. Uh, we're looking very closely at what they call, for lack of a better term, I'll use depth of stock. What does it take for a store to be able to be authorized to be a SNAP store? Um, particularly in communities, we're starting to look at what should that mix be? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not happy with the mix right now, and so we're working and, and thinking through what that um, new mix would be. Uh, but a lot of this has to come through Congress um, because the uh, legislation um, that established the program has also set what the authorization of requirements would be. And so we need to work through, and we're going to work through that. But that's an area that we definitely have focused. How do we change the availability in stores that, SNAP, that accept SNAP benefits, which then 
I, we believe will also continue to change people's behavior. I, I think the second question, though, is one that, that could, could you design a program, whether you should oh, is a could. different story, could. but could you design a program where uh, SNAP recipients would be limited to uh, certain food items like the WIC program currently did. The, and, 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 I, and I think the answer to that is yes, Congress could design such yes. a program. Now, uh, it has a lot of issues and problems associated with it in mm -hmm. terms of, although we do limit some things in the SNAP program right. now, but, uh, but that's a public policy decision that Congress would have to make. I don't see any likelihood that that's going to happen in this farm bill. Well, given what it would then mean to the industry itself and how you would carry it out, I mean, Ohio's just passed some legislation about what is healthy food, and so mm -hmm. how do you define healthy food? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are lots of things that um, uh, I think challenges to try and create a program, and that's why we're looking at what's happening with this uh, Walmart uh, uh, store, this uh, WIC store in a store, thinking about are there various um, strategies that we can use around this, a similar kind of approach. But you're right, if Congress wanted to um, design something, but I, they could recommend something, they could do that. Um, the devil is in the details and how you would implement a program like that. Uh, I think it would cost more to implement a program like that than it would, the benefits would be in terms of the changing of people's behavior. Thank you. Last question. Thank you. My name is Julie Knight. I'm with Strategic Conservation Solutions, and I've also been involved with the Bipartisan Policy Center project. And I am um, just in putting all of these um, questions together. I mean, a lot of really valid points have been raised. I think there's agreement that we do need to look comprehensively at how are we providing incentives um, for people to change their purchasing the topic of today's um, program. And so as we look at this, I think the point about um, leveraging the public-private partnerships, I think there's agreement and, and it's, it's a no-brainer that that's essential. And how do you do that? Um, the, the, so many, um, whether it's private dollars or public dollars, are looking for seeding a new initiative to get a community started in an initiative and then how do you sustain it? And so who's the last one left holding the bag trying to sustain the program? You know, it's a real challenge. And, and I'm sure you all have thought about it in greater detail than I have. So I guess, you know, what I'm looking at, and I think maybe Orrin Hesterman brought up the point about, is it a, a reallocation or perhaps Stan about, you know, is it looking at the funding that's there and how do you re reallocate that money? But um, looking at w comprehensively um, when in the winter and the farmer's markets close, the grocery store pilot initiative, can we get people to change um, behavior, all people, all of us, um, so that we want to buy what's good for us at any time. So, so my question, when we talk about scaling up, and, and I know there's different ways to define it, but when we look at this in the sense of policy, we talk budget. Is there a sense of what would be the cost to scale up a program like this, to really scale up to our 47, 48 million SNAP recipients to make some sort of program available? I mean, it's it's hard to figure that out I because <laughs> because we don't we don't really know what SNAP is being spent on now. Right. But but a, a sort of a, a couple of, of, of interesting points. Um, uh, I'm not going to say I advocate this, but an interesting conversation with somebody from Walmart who was asking me, Oren, what would it take to have double up food bucks happening in Walmart stores nationwide? Mm -hmm. And I said it, it's actually pretty easy to figure out if you can tell me. Uh, how much, how many SNAP dollars are spent at Walmart right now on fruits and vegetables? And he had the figure in his head. Sure. He knew that. Um, so basically, we figured out uh, it would take about a billion and a half dollars to do double up food bucks and cover um, all of the fruits and vegetables happening, you know, at Walmart right now. And he kind of takes this big gasp, right? And I said, but you need to, you need to realize that's less than 2% of the entire SNAP budget mm -hmm. nationwide right now. So that what I think about is, you know, the question I ask right now isn't what it's gonna to take to like do it globally. Right now we're asking the question is, how we're we gonna get $100 million over the next farm bill into this so we can start matching our good friends at, in philanthropy to actually bring this partnership into being. It's really a tiny amount of money in terms of the need, but it gets us started. But then what I also think about is, what would it look like if we had 
one, two, or 10%, the equivalent of 10% of a SNAP budget moving into an area like this, it is a game changer for our food system. It is a game changer for the health of our kids. You start thinking about $7 billion, $7.5 billion a year starting to go into focusing on healthier eating for our kids and into the pockets of local agriculture, it's a game changer for our food system. And that's why we're doing this, because we see that potential. It's not gonna happen tomorrow, may not happen for 10 years, but the potential is there. But, and let me also add that if you, I mean, the data that we have collected, when you look at how SNAP participants spend their money, um, at the early part of the month, they're buying healthy food. Yep. Um, they have, the resources are there, they are buying healthier food. As the month goes on, you see more processed food coming in, and as you get to the end of the month, it is all starch. And what we need to also look at is what do we base our um, SNAP benefit on? Um, what is the healthy food index is what we use right now. Thrifty food plan, I'm sorry, is what we use right now. Is that, when it was created, sufficient to give people the resources that they need to be able to buy a healthy food throughout the month? Um, you know, I happen to be one that believes that people want to do, once educated with the information, people want to do what's right for themselves and their families. Um, and if they have the resources, they're going to buy healthy food. But if you look at how the expenditures are made, you can see the trail off. Um, and we're looking at things like split issuance now. So that maybe if you have the first two issuances a month, you're able to better utilize your resources to buy healthy food. So I think one of the other things that we often miss is if we sit down and talk to the benefits, the participants in these programs, they will tell you what it will take for them to buy healthier food. Um, and it's two things that I've heard when I've talked to them is resources and access. And if they have those two, they already know that they need to be purchasing healthier foods. And now kids are coming home with information about healthier eating, and schools are looking at ways they can help parents figure out how to do healthier, um, uh, make healthier purchases. So it is a question of how do we change people's behavior, but I think people are already just trying to manage with the limited resources they have to eat healthy. Linda Joe, final word. And I would say that this work, Healthy Food Insensitives, needs to be looked at within the context of the community food system as a whole. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What is the vision of communities? And then how to bring the market forces to bear and public policy so that the most vulnerable have access because we know the public supports this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good.